So welcome everybody to the Fates and Graces Mythologium panel confronting colonialism and white supremacy in myth sponsored by the Pacifica Graduate Institute Alumni Association. Big thank you to the PGIAA and the incredible director of alumni relations, Diane Travis Teague for sponsoring this panel. PGIAA's motto is through soul community thrives. Our panel has three speakers, Dr. Rosalie Nell Bauk, <laughs> C. Gabriel, and Dr. Brandon Williams Craig. And we will begin the panel with some words from the PGIAA Board Vice President, Dr. Olivia Happel Blop. So before each presentation, I will introduce the speaker, Rosalie C., and then Brandon, and I will ask them to unmute their line. And at the end of all three presentations, I'll invite the panelists to join me at the virtual panelist table for our yes and discussion. If you have questions, the audience, please click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and type your questions and click submit. And I will bring your questions into the space out loud for conversation during our yes and discussion. So to begin this panel, I'd like to introduce PGIAA Board Vice President, Dr. Olivia Happel Block to say a few words. Olivia. Thank you, Stephanie. All right, so as I stated, my name is Dr. Olivia Happel Block and I am the Vice President for the PGIAA, um, so the Pacifica Graduate Institute Alumni Association. Uh, Stephanie stated our motto earlier, and I actually included our mission statement and what I wanted to say today, um, which is to develop and operate an educational and charitable organization that supports Pacifica Graduate Institute alumni and the wider community in pursuit of developing their intellectual, spiritual, altruistic, and professional capabilities. To further its mission, the association will engage in varied charitable and educational activities and programs. So part of serving our alumni and community entails addressing the needs and experiences of all of our members. Over the past year, our board has been having discussions around race, ethnicity, and diversity at Pacifica Graduate Institute. Throughout these discussions, we have seen the continued inequities within the institution and its broader communities. We've composed a letter that has been signed by students, faculty, and staff highlighting the need for change and how our BIPOC students, faculty, and staff have been treated in the past and how they should be treated in the future. This panel today is about calling us into the discussion on race, mythology, and healing. We know that mythology can be a powerful tool for healing the wounds that we have, but we also recognize that there are still gaps in representation and equity in our field. I look forward to hearing from our three presenters on these topics and invite us all to consider what it is that we are being called in to do, say, and think through these presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. We'll begin with Rosalie's presentation, held in Brujadas, reading Mesoamerican myths of femininity as a radical response to contemporary colonialism. Dr. Rosalie Nell Bauck has degrees in mythological studies, philosophy, and political science, and over a decade of experience as a community organizer, nonprofit project developer, and educator among underserved populations. She has spent time living in Mexico and in Guatemala among the Kichimaya. Her current work is as a narrative consultant for decolonizing projects and draws from her academic education, lifelong activism, and unique cultural perspectives. Please welcome Dr. Bauk. Hey guys, am I, am, am I on here? I'm having a hard time. Can I go ahead and share my screen? Cool, okay. Let's get this um, screen share going. I am so honored to start this day. Um, and 
kick off this discussion, which is very important to me um, and definitely at the core of my work. I promise to do a lot in my uh, description of this talk and I'm going to do my best to um, keep to that. Hopefully I can have my slides working in tandem here. So, um, I've got to move this screen to see my screen over here. Most important thing to understand about, wait, can you guys see my slides? Give me a thumbs up, Stephanie, if you can see the slide. Right now we're seeing your PowerPoint screen. Um, okay, oh, it doesn't want to let me go to, well, this so might I'm be sure. a little awkward. I'm flipping back and forth. Um, you can just leave it there now. Reading, so. We can roll with it. Oh, there you go. There you go. Now we see it. Okay. Okay, hopefully this will work. So the most important thing to understand about Mesoamerican myths of the feminine is that you will never understand them. Certainly never fully and completely as we long to do as modern scholars shaped by that thirst for empirical evidence that we feel is so natural to this intellectual era that we have been born into. That drive that values reason so highly and is so innately skeptical of the ineffable and the divine. We are after all, citizens of the great enlightenment era governed by the longing compulsion perhaps to enlighten, to shed light on, to know everything. We culturally revere Descartes who taught us to identify primarily uh, solely really with our minds, um, our rational faculties. And as any student of introductory philosophy, an introductory philosophy class will know, we draw our roots proudly straight up from Plato. who taught us to throw off our shackles that kept us in the cave and come out into the light like, like civilized beings and know things, know, know everything. Um, there's art there. Uh, a long time ago, and as a young and ambitious student of political philosophy, I became skeptical of these things, of this tradition. So I began to ask, what about the cave? Why were we in the cave to begin with? If we take seriously this trend of honoring old cultures, of rejecting terms like savage, as we do as good scholars, then we also have to question Plato as one of our great Western fathers of thought and whether he was implying that some people were savages, lesser than others, that those cave people, those dark thinkers, those immersed in the earth people were symbolic of the savage mind. Savage, I'm using obviously like a colloquial, colloquially here, kind of a how, how they would have used it um, and how early thinkers did. Now, maybe you are asking yourself, what does this have to do with Mesoamerican myth or goddesses, femininity? Well, to me, it has everything to do with it. And if I'm going to try to show you how Mesoamerican goddesses are in their very existence, the key to decolonizing, I have to try to quickly paint for you how I encountered these dark figures, which was not on the quest for a deeper understanding of femininity. In fact, I had zero interest in goddess studies most of my academic career and know how I came to know and embrace ultimately to revere the Mesoamerican tradition and the formation of the feminine within it was because it emerged for me as part of a social system, a set of values that organized the way a society was run, a society that had a built-in values protection against things like toxic masculinity or rule of any extreme, um, the things that we equate with decolonizing that caused, decol that caused colonial to that protection. They have been lost in modern society. And I believe if we understand their stories and tell their stories in a way that honors them, we can bring them back and they can guide us into a more just era. In the next few minutes, I will do my best to share with you a very condensed version of a complex argument I make in my dissertation about how that shift would and I hope will allow us to reorient our culture away from patriarchal, hierarchical, colonialist practices and toward a true deep inclusivity. Um, okay, so the cave. The problem with leaving the cave, of course, where we get hung up in our cultural march towards shedding light on all things, is that some things are antithetical to light and to reason. They cease to be, cease to exist in any natural or full expression when they are forced into the light. Some things exist only in darkness, in caves, in chaotic spaces that repel reason. These are things uh, and places I identify as borderlands. And they serve a critical function in society, all societies. These are things we can catch a glimpse of with our minds, but they seem to perish in meaning as we try to run them through our analytical faculties. They would stump Descartes. 
These are the underworld things, the dark things we tend to know more intimately, more honestly in our emotional spaces, in our bodies, in our souls. We encounter them in our own darkness. And while as union-minded folks, as many of us are, we honor this theory, we know all about the shadow, but the fact is here in the modern Western world, our culture is built on a rejection of these spaces, a denial of darkness, a cultural march out of the cave and into the great light of reason that ultimately leaves us into a society that is necessarily not inclusive and is hierarchical. And unless we find a way back into the cave, into a cultural narrative, a myth that truly confronts this Western tendency and brings us into a collective story that honors darkness, we can design all the policies and do all the trainings, but we are not really shifting the problematic foundation of our culture out of enlightenment era, colonialist thinking. We are not decolonizing. And Mesoamerican myth is the way into these spaces. It expresses a radically different cosmic thing found in the Western world. And yet it is a cultural narrative that is still alive on our, and on our soil in this country today. There's a little more on the cave for you for a second. So just to get us um, all on the same page, let's touch on what I mean by Medlam. Um, the term Mesoamerica, of course, is a modern concept that comes with its own problems, and thus I use the term lightly. It is a geographical definition made by modern scholars of the land now known as Latin America, a piece of the land now known as Latin America that um, shared a number of qualities and in particular central focus on corn, southern North America and central parts of Central America. The peoples of Mesoamerica include the Olmec, the many cultures of the Maya, and finally um, the great empire that was interrupted by the European conquest, the Mexica, or as we better know them, the Aztecs. So now that we have, have a sense of what the greater importance of that cave dwelling feminine may be for us culturally, let us turn more properly to myth where I will do my best to give you a glimpse of this feral force. So for a few minutes, let's visit the myth that you may know of, of the myth of Quetzalcoatl. I would call it the myth of Quetzalcoatl and Tezcatlipoca. So if you've heard of any Mesoamerican mythological figure, it's likely this guy, the feathered serpent who shows up in some form in every Mesoamerican culture. Uh, this is the very famous myth of the Aztecs that tells of a particular incarnation of this figure in which he is a man, a king priest figure who rules Tula, um, sometimes known as Tolan, a mythical kingdom and also a historical city in which everyone is fed, happy, has lots of stuff, access to education. It's a virtual utopia. So um, then one day, an evil sorcerer, as we're often told in the myths, Tezcatlipoca comes in with his gang and destroys the whole thing. He wants to destroy Quetzalcoatl, run him out of town. And in doing so, Tezcatlipoca and his evil crew rain destruction down on the whole city. Plague, famine, shame to the king by tricking him into getting drunk and sleeping with his sister. Um, in the end, Quetzalcoatl, as man and king is ruined, limps away from his devastated shell of a once great city and gives himself over to the water where he dies and eventually reborn as a god. The almost universal interpretation of the story is that Tezcatlipoca is a force of evil and Quetzalcoatl is a culture hero, as he's often referred to. If you've heard anything about Quetzalcoatl, it probably fits into that narrative. This interpretation, I argue, is a projection of our enlightenment hierarchical minds, and it is not an interpretation that represents the pre-conquest Mesoamerican worldview. This is a topic that I could, and in my, in my dissertation I do, explore in detail. Here I'm going to give you uh, the top lines of that argument to help you shift into a mode that I call corn consciousness, a way of seeing the world in cycles uh, as ever shifting as Mesoamericans once did and some still do. In my dissertation, I go on at length about how the greatest scholars of Mesoamerica and myth in general um, project all kinds of good and evil type judgment onto this story. Even the term sorcerer that uh, Beerhorst gives us, that we use those of us who have attended Pacifica may have read his translation. Brings, um, it's perhaps the most reliable sort of male witch and then goes on to be interpreted quickly by other scholars as the evil doer. And many of us in our field are vigilant about identifying this kind of problematic logical equation, which with evil in Western traditions, 
But in Mesoamerican scholarship, it's the problem that has not been well addressed. It's still pretty pervasive. Um, so the central problem with that interpretation is simple. Indigenous Mesoamericans don't believe in evil. It is totally antithetical to their worldview. And while a lot of direct information about Mesoamerican myth and ritual has been obscured or processed through Christian and modern enlightenment type interpretations generally, we do know a fair amount about Mesoamerican philosophy and worldview that's more direct. And so what is well documented is that all pre-conquest Mesoamerican cultures believed the world operated in cycles. It was constantly in motion. In motion. That included values and dominating principles. It means that nothing is ever better than another thing. It's, it, it's no, there is no stagnant hierarchy. The idea that we are so committed to in the modern world that one thing is better than another thing, heaven better than hell, logos above mythos, my political ideology superior to your political ideology, none of that would have even made sense to, to, to pre-conquest Mesoamericans who had more of a sense of just what is, is. We don't control the world. It's our job to honor the elements and keep all the pieces of culture and cosmos connected um, and alive, honored, and not to take on the role of gods and guide it. You can see this value carried through in modern Mexican culture and the widespread reverence for death. Why honor death? Why honor the underworld? We might ask, well, a 15th century Aztec might ask us, why would you throw the world out of balance by honoring only life, only light, only knowledge you can verify with your faculties? That's just asking for trouble. So back to our myth. Uh, let's hold on to this question. The thought as we turn as we turn back to it, if no thing is innately superior to another thing, and if nothing is stagnant, then what does that actually mean for Tula and Quetzalcoatl? It means that A, Tula, utopia that it is, it can't last forever, maybe not even long, because after all, everything is in flux. Everything must die, social structures included, and even things we think are really good. Then B, Tezcatlipoca, that destructive plague bearing force. Well, if we are true to the Mesoamerican worldview, we have to understand him as equally important as our beloved hero Quetzalcoatl. So here's where things get even more uncomfortable, kind of challenging. Tezcatlipoca is a figure universally classified as male from what I can find. And, and in this story, um, I believe he's a manifestation of femininity. He is uh, the most potent here, the most potent revolutionary important kind of femininity in Mesoamerican myth and philosophy, and maybe the world at large. The backstory of this myth is that Quetzalcoatl was being punished. And if you read the myth carefully in its entirety, you'll know that Tezcatlipoca is there to teach uh, Quetzalcoatl a lesson because Quetzalcoatl as a king is a revolutionary himself. And he's doing something that no king before him ever dared to do. He's not sacrificing. Actually, even worse, he is sacrificing snakes and butterflies, and creatures that don't give much blood. So while our modern minds appreciate this, this is part of why we love Quetzalcoatl, because he's civilized and he isn't doing this really uncomfortable stuff like cutting out people's hearts with obsidian knives and rolling severed heads down the pyramids. Um, that Things that seem really unreasonable to us, uh, really a confrontational to our, our modern abilities, maybe even a bit, I don't know, savage. Well, if we can suspend our enlightenment values for just a few more minutes and stay in the domain of the feral feminine, we may be able to come to terms just momentarily with the fact that historically, Mesoamerican gods were understood to demand sacrifice, and in particular, blood, and a lot of it, as is well documented by religious studies scholars and anthropologists alike. One of the primary consistent beliefs throughout Mesoamerica, um, I'll Mesoamerican cultures was that blood fed the earth. There was a, a sacrificial gift giving cycle and it went like this. People fed the gods blood, gods fed the earth water, the earth fed the people corn and other stuff. And this was a pact, a mutual agreement. It was perhaps the primary duty of any ruler to keep this cycle going. So when Quetzalcoatl is sitting here in his world of plenty and when it comes time for him to sacrifice, he sacrifices a butterfly which not only doesn't give blood, but is winged and so falls into a classification of creature that is particularly offensive because it's related to the gods and should not be messed with. It's a big screw you to the gods. It's the Mesoamerican mythological version of the Boston Tea Party. 
It's hubristic. I don't need your assistance anymore, big guys. Well, a revolution against the gods, the very forces of the cosmos, it's more difficult to get away with than leaving the mother country. And Quetzalcoatl knew it, which is why in the Smith, we find him suspiciously walled up like a recluse inside of his castle, never leaving, hiding, it seems to me, from Tezcatlipoca, the great reconciler, who's his brother, by the way, whom he knows will inevitably come. And Tezcatlipoca enters Tula, shape-shifting from a man to a god, to a force of nature, to an old woman with tortillas. But in every form, he's a manifestation of one type of energy, that destructive, corrective feminine energy. This is an energy that has one purpose, to bring elements back into relation with one another, to start the cycle when it has stopped. In this case, to remind the city of Tula that while they may have everything they want, they have ignored their gods, nature, a classic case of hubris. They have tried to stop the cycle and become master over a natural order of things. This is something that I have found pops up consistently in Mesoamerican myth. It's a masculine ruler, a, seeming, a seemingly content situation or kingdom, an attachment to an order of things, and then an onset of what I call a wasteland. Okay. Is my, is this still, it's telling me my internet's unstable. Is it sounding good? You're good. It gets a little choppy, but your sounds good. good. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm wondering if I can quickly fix that or if it's not something I can do anything about. Just yeah, I'd, I'd say just keep going. You're okay. We're getting okay. <laughs> cool. Okay. So a wasteland, this is a wasteland. A wasteland is, of course, a motif we know best through the Grail legends, but I love tracing it in Mesoamerican myth because I have found that it is a part of a greater, vibrant, admittedly terrifying plot, a mythological truth, I might say. In this part of the world, a wasteland is a part of the feral feminine cycle. This feminine is nothing like the soft, beautiful feminine. It is not passive. It is not appeasing. This is no Mother Mary. This American, the Mesoamerican brand of feral femininity is also not the lovely, dark, enticing goddess and is not a beautiful feminine figure on a, her horse with a sword. We find her bringing plague, total destruction, death. But the way in which she does it and the reason for doing it are what make the action not only feminine, but feral, absolutely wild in a burn down the building kind of a way. This is a corrective force. And then that she's actually nurturing and often overlooked. Uh, it, she's nurturing in an often overlooked way. She is the archetypal mother love and the most devouring presence. The only thing powerful enough to move us from the most immobilized places. Czech philosopher Slava Zizek once said that the, a truly radical act is not neutral, but a, its most radical level is a feminine gesture. There's something about the feminine that can really move things, that can confront anything. This is something that anyone who has ever been in labor can tell you. The very process of the greatest creative act known to humans, birth, feels like wrestling with certain death. And then, of course, there's that feeling that any mother knows, like you could burn down cities for your children's well-being. Lori Anzaldúa taught me a lot about mother energy when she talked about being held in brujadas. She pulled from a Mesoamerican myth as well. The term in brujadas has some sorcery itself, containing that tricky word, which bruja in Spanish, native Spanish speakers have translated this for me as haunted, though Anzal Dua herself prefers bewitched. She is something, uh, she is sometimes quoted using this term in her beautiful work, Borderlands La Frontera, saying, to be held embrujadas is to be kept from our destiny, our soul arrested. That is often interpreted as being tragically held back, can't move forward, prevented from progressing. That sounds like a bad thing. It sounds like a wasteland. But listen to the larger context of this quote. When pain, suffering, and the advent of death become intolerable, there is Tlazoltiotl hovering at the crossroads of life to lure a person away from his or her seemingly, seemingly appointed destination. And we are held embrujadas, kept from our destiny, our soul arrested. Now, this does sound like Quetzalcoatl's wasteland situation in Tula. She indicates that Tlazoltiotl, a critical dark goddess of filth and cleanliness, steps in and she lures her stuck individual away from their destiny. That sounds a lot like what Tezcatlipoca is doing, luring Quetzalcoatl with booze to his ultimate act of humiliation. But the crux of the sentence and of the archetypal mythological story that I'm suggesting Anzaldúa is tapping into here 
is when she says, Plaza Tioto lures us away from our seemingly appointed destination where we thought we were going, not where we were actually supposed to go, according to the gods. Um, this, is the type, this is the type of reading, the looking past the apparent meaning and wrestling with the obscured message and the cave of meaning that starts to bring us into the relation with the feral feminine. It's the only way I know to teach it through art and literature. When we read on Zoldua and accept the first meaning that comes to us, we read her story as one simply of loss, an individual sadly prevented from their destiny, like a king unjustly pushed out of his kingdom, poor Quetzalcoatl. And Zaldua tells us that the worst case scenario, once we are in Brujadas, is a destruction that reorients us, that takes us to the borderlands. We meet the great mother goddess Coatlicue, and the earth opens and plunges us into its maw, it devours us. We can hear in her writing a tone almost of relief, as we can understand that to be held in Brujadas, yes, to be came painfully kept from where you want to get even destroyed, but in that darkness, you are back in the cave, um, you are lovingly destroyed in the maw of the great Elra mother. This is the borderlands, the wild birthing space um, is where we can regenerate. And with this knowledge, maybe we can turn back to Quetzalcoatl, read his story as less of a tragedy, more of a love story. Tezcatlipoca, the great destroyer after all, is his brother. So here's what's a little harder to accept. I'll finish up here. What gets a lot more personal for us, sometimes these myths tell us, we are sure we know what is best we are, and, and we are still wrong. That happens culturally as well. So sometimes our values may seem to be in the right place, but we are still clinging to the belief that we know how to get there. This insistence that we know the way is the function of the enlightenment thinking, hyper-reason. It's distinctly masculine and it grows weak over time. It gets stagnant like Tula. As a mother, I sometimes encounter a microcosm of this energy when I tell my two and three three-year-olds they can't have another cookie and they're indignant I've just ruined everything they can list the reasons this isn't unjust I bring down their little worlds with perfect confidence because I can see the whole it's my job to anticipate their well-being cultivate their natural senses and steer them into a healthy balanced life whether or not they like it the energy is also um, at war in a broader way in our culture today where many people are insistent they know the way to solve problems we are sure that we know what is best, but we are also like the Toltecs existing in a cultural rejection of the cave, of the feminine. The problem is we are trying to stay in Tula, hoping we can just exchange one set of principles, one king for another. While Mesoamerican myths of the wasteland remind us that there is actually no such thing as a king, not in the natural order of things. Nothing rules anything else in an ongoing way. Everything is in a cycle, it lives, it dies. No matter how good or just it is, not because we are bad or even wrong, simply because it is not our job to know and control all things. Mesoamerican myth reminds us that us as humans are like small children who can easily get distracted by wanting more cookies and even get deeply focused on our desires, build wor worlds for them. But if we have built those worlds without listening to our mother, we are at risk of overlooking something, hitting a point of stagnancy, maybe something like a pandemic. And when you hit that wasteland, these stories tell us you have two options. Willingly go back into the cave, into the maw of the feral feminine, breathe life into that creative chaotic, or fall into total disconnection and deadlock, and eventually Tezcatlipoca will arrive and burn the whole thing down. That's it. Thanks. Wow. Thank you, Rosalie. Let's show Rosalie some mythologium love in the chat. <laughs> Thank you. All right, our next speaker is C, whose presentation is called, Who's Your Daddy? The Norse, the Nazis, and the World Stage. C. Gabriel is a storyteller via audio, video, text, and interactive media. She is currently finishing her Pacifica dissertation on the potential to combat oppression through storytelling, specifically concentrating on Norse mythology and its relationship to white supremacy and gender. Her relevant background is in shamanism, graphic design, and advertising. Please welcome C. Gabriel. Thank you so much. That was lovely. And thank you, Rosalie. I so wish I had seen that before I put my presentation together, but it was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> OK, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. And did it work? 
looks great. Great. Okay, it's giving me a weird warning, but we're moving ahead. Um, okay, this is Odin. <laughs> um, so actually, before we start, I think I'm going to go ahead and do this, though I might talk fast later for it. Um, I'd like it if everybody could do just a very brief meditation. We're just going to take like one to two minutes. If you could just relax a moment, get slightly comfortable and close your eyes. And I would like you to think of the child that you love most in the world. So just think of that child and think how much you love that child and how much you would do for that child. Okay, and then I would like you to think of the last person you saw who held a sign that said anything helps. And I'd like you to think about how much you love that person and how much you would do for that person. Okay, you can go ahead and come back. Sorry if that was disturbing. Um, but that is one of the roots of racism. That is, in fact, all of the roots of our division as a species. We tend to cooperate beautifully up until the time of sustenance. As soon as we have start to build a surplus, however, we start to kill each other and become divisive and hierarchical in our attempts to make sure that our children live instead of our neighbors. So on that dandy note, um, when I was a child, I was in a very unhappy place. I had a really rough childhood. And when I would lay down at night, I would have trouble sleeping um, because I was just so stressed out and frightened. And in my mind, Odin would appear in front of me. I didn't know it was Odin at the time and pull out a blade and throw it through my heart. And I would fall backwards into a grave and fall asleep. And that was my idea of peace as a kid. And Hillman would say that that makes Odin's my relationship to me part of my genius. Oh, look, we're not moving ahead with this. There we go. And part of my Orlog. So in the Norse theme, we have the fates. So their fates are called the Nornir. And they have two types of fate itself, Orlog and Weird. And Orlog is the fate of our birth, and it includes all of the physical things about us, as well as our ancestry and all our personal proclivities. And then weird is the fate of our choice. So Orlog are the destinations we need to stop at. There is no, no other way. You will be stopping there. Well, weird is the path that you take between them. It's pretty set, but it is not wholly set the way that Orlog is. And the, these, uh, these Nornir, use a magical art called Galder, which is singing the world into being with their voices. They actually create those stops in Orlog that move us along. Okay, so that would be our Orlog. And Hillman calls that Orlog genius. Um, and he speaks of the way that we engage that genius. We have no choice but to bring that part of ourselves forward for whatever reason. He also speaks to the way that both personally and communally, we bring forward these mythological gods. Um, they arise within us or within our communities in order to bring forward their light. So we see their shadow that we might bring their light. We see the way that they oppress that we might learn to worship them. And so one of the ways that we talk about or we deal with racism in Norse or the reason that Norse and racism are so incredibly intertwined and they are, as we shall see, um, is from this story. This is the sto a story called Rigstola. And it's a story about Rig, who is probably Heimdall, the guardian of the gods. And he goes around the world and has threesomes with three couples in order to create the quote unquote three races of man. The first one is the thralls or the slaves. You'll note this is probably not what you think of when you think slaves, but this is what a slave looked like at that time. Um, the second race is the carls or the craftspeople. And the third is the jarls or the elite. And Odin will become the god of the elite, the god of the Jarls, which is a little strange. Um, and he is called the Allfather as that. So at this point in time, 
they are a pantheon. So as Rosalie was saying, there's not this good and bad. Nobody is weighted more than another. Everybody takes their seat at the table and they are all equal contributors and they all have an appropriate time and place. They don't have a, you know, you're the good one or you're the bad one. Unfortunately, when people re-myth that whole racism thing with uh, Riggs Villa, um, they talk about him as if, he is the, as if he is the Aryan father, when in fact he is the all father. And he's the all father for two reasons. The first one is the other competing story of the birth of humanity is Odin. He, with two of his friends, actually blow life into the boughs of a tree of two trees, creating man and woman. Um, and then he continues when he learns of the prophecy that the world will, will end in a huge war, Ragnarok. He, uh, his strategy, one of his strategies is to impregnate women in every culture so that he has children all over the world. So he is weirdly also the God of diversity. So, although, you know, misogynistic diversity there, but diversity nonetheless. And he was part of that pantheon at the beginning, but he ends up getting written out over time. So pre-Wagner, which is where I'm starting next, um, there was this pantheon. And you can see in this photo, the first image is Thor, who we still have. And then we have Odin there in the middle, that's his Gungnir. Um, and then the last one in here is Freyr. And Freyr is the one who actually carried the archetype of a king. Prayer is the good man, the agriculture, he's the husband, he's the one who stays still and takes care of his community, but he is completely written out by Wagner, um, who changes it to a hierarchical, hierarchical perspective as he makes Odin, who is the god of death, and therefore the god of war, king, and he puts him in absolute power over all the others. This was not true prior to that time. Um, and part of the reason that Wagner made these choices um, is because he wanted to unify Germany. So Germany at that time was a bunch of smaller states and they were attempting to get together and form a greater nation and they were really struggling with that. And so he wrote stories of the, you know, the supremacy of the German people so that they would unify under these cultural myths. And he brought Odin forward to bring forward a single figure that could lead them. Um, probably inappropriately. Uh, and he was a very competitive man. And his two biggest competitors were Mendelssohn and Meyerbeer, both of who were Jewish. And so he spoke about why they were inferior. Their art was inferior because they were inferior because they were Jewish. And this started the anti-Semitism at the time. Um, and so he really laid the mythological foundation for the Third Reich moving forward. And then that was taken up by von Liszt, who came a little while after him. Von Liszt is an academic who had decided to research the runes. So there are the original runes. And he drew his own set of runes, which was now, you know, this power of Wagner, the power of the people. Um, there's his rune set. And that becomes the symbol for the uh, Third Reich, for the Nazi army, um, who is headed by Himmler. And uh, Himmler is an occultist. And uh, he, he puts forward the idea of blood beyond borders. So now he's only interested in people of Germanic blood. Um, and he feels that the nation is actually not a physical location, but rather the people who began in that physical location. He's, he also has everybody have sex in a graveyard so that he can hopefully bring forward their past ancestors. So he is really pulling from the past in order to create more Orlog. So in each of these, the idea of those fates those, they're re-pulling those stops of Orlog into the world and they're changing where people have to go, right? They're telling a new story that brings forward a new area. So they are using Galder at each step in order to create another mythology that will create other mandatory actions, in this case, world domination. Um, but you know, that doesn't work as well as it might. Um, Jung actually describes them as Eric Griffin Height, which is possessed. He says that they are possessed by the spirit of Wotan. Wotan and Odin are the same guy. That's just the same name in different languages, which I will spare you how that happens, but same word. 
Um, and he actually goes down at the end of the Third Reich saying, I cannot change. He announces to the world that he is incapable of change before he burns. So it's very ironic to me that he begins the Third Reich. He begins his command with a huge fire and then he is cremated and he is essentially burning the world the whole time. So while he claims he cannot change, he is transforming everything through the very element of change. Um, and we would hope that we, I would hope, I would have hoped that we would put down our now hyper assault versions of the Norse gods at that time, but we don't, we import them to the USA. So in 1949, Marvel takes up with Loki and brings him over. In 1962, he's got Thor, and by 1964, Odin is a primary character in Marvel Comics. And again, they are very sort of hardcore, um, not very kind versions of their godly selves. Um, and so that sets the mythological foundation, but we need another realm. And so we take it up in the social world by the prison system. So the white supremacists who went to prison were not happy. So when a white man goes to prison for the first time, and I'm sorry to use white and man, but it is, they're both privileges. Um, he usually feels betrayed. He usually feels abjectly betrayed by God and the world because everyone has always told him that he was born the right way, that everything he did would be graced and appreciated, that he was the one who deserved to be lauded. And so when he ends up in prison, he has a great deep sense of betrayal. Everything has fallen out from under him. Also, probably the first time in his life that he is in a minority instead of majority. So he's also really frightened. So this is not a good psychological state. And the only time that ethnic groups can get together within a prison system is for religious observation, observances. Um, and there isn't one that is just white people, right? Other cultural groups have different religions, but Christianity is open to anyone. And so they, in 2005, a bunch of white supremacists get together and they petition and they get Odinism, Satanism, and a white supremacist form, form of Christianity certified as official religions so that they can be carried out in the prison system. And Odinism just takes off. Um, not only is it you know, nice to get together with one's white brethren, apparently, you get these cool little hammers that you're allowed to wear. So you're not allowed to wear anything in prison, but you get a hammer if you become an Odinist. Um, and as people leave prison, they take this back to their communities. And so suddenly the numbers in the KKK and in the Nazis and the alt-right alt start to soar as people are released from prison and are now hardcore Odinists. And Odin, because these people were usually Christian to begin with, very few were actually heathen to begin with, they don't have Odin himself, as I would think of him, as their god. What they have is their imagination of a god of war mashed up with this omnipresent Christian god, which is a horrible god. You know, it's this horrible, doom-reigning god of pain. This is not a good god. Um, but and that's the one that they're spreading around to the other white supremacists when they get home. But important to note that not all heathens are hateful. <laughs> so many people were he he heathen before that time. Sorry to trip on that. There were lots of heathens before. They are not always hateful people. They are often very, very upset at what all the white supremacists are now doing to their religion. Like this is so not okay with them. Um, and so that also happens. And there are also different tracks from Odinism. There's Vanatru, which is the worship of the older veneer gods, and Disatru, which is worship of female ancestors. And so it's much more complicated than that, but Odinism is still problematic. And it's not even based on our regular Odin. So it is based on that first Odin. And so the original, you know, Odinism is not, but the other heathen religions are based on the original Odin. And the original Odin is a very compassionate God of wandering. And so he's really a God in many ways of tradition. And so he's the God of tradition and the original Loki, who is his brother, not his son, his brother <laughs> is actually the God of spontaneity. In the original myths, 
Loki actually is self-sacrificing in every myth until the last one. It's like he gets completely fed up and turns. But in every other myth, he absolutely lays down his life for the group every time. He is the most dependable, I would say, of the gods in the Norse pantheon in terms of showing up for his community. Um, Thor is not a god of force in the original myth. Thor is originally a god of community and justice. He's actually a judge, and he actually takes care of people in the community, and he's known as sort of the people's god. So he's the one who was the, really the god of the thralls and the carls back when we were looking at the three sets. Odin was the god of the jarls. And then we have Schlepnir, and Schlepnir is Loki's oldest. <laughs> and Schlepnir is a horse with eight legs, and he's the community's psychopomp. So in many ways, he's really redemption. He takes people to hell and back to save them. So he's really your underworld guide in the original mythology. And that gives a nice mythology in my mind where you have tradition and spontaneity at the top. So again, this is just a myopic part of the pantheon. This is not the full pantheon. But if we're just looking at the gods in question, we have tradition and spontaneity, and then we have it on top of justice and redemption. That's a very healthy life, in my opinion, um, as opposed to what it turns into. So then when we started, you know, in 2011, we get the th first Thor movie the, with the cinematic universe. I'm trying not to break copyright. So we have some kludgy images. Um, but Odin here is a divine authority. You know, he is absolutely the top. There is no question what he says goes, and he doesn't need to pass it by anyone. Um, and then we have Thor, who is his son, and Thor is no longer interested in community or justice now. A little bit of community, but not a lot, and no justice. Thor is really just interested in force at this point. And then Loki has become, instead of spontaneity, chaos. And I'm really glad that Tom Hiddleston wore that costume in public so I had an image I could use. <laughs> but they're a very different set. Um, so when you put these together, and the, to me, it's huge that Loki was demoted. To demote Loki totally throws off the balance of this portion of the pantheon. So now we have a very authoritarian, Odin on top of force and chaos, which is the picture of fascism. This is so the mythology of fascism that we have completely played out. It's kind of crazy. And this is what was entertaining us when we had the election in 2016. Like that's what everything what was going on prior to the 2016 election. And then we elected Trump, of course, um, on the... Uh, <laughs> make America great again, which he trademarked as his own and then put out cease and desist for all the other Republicans so that they couldn't use it, which I find really interesting. Um, and he sadly really upheld the Nazi party. So one of the things that the, this is the American Nazi party, they have a website, you can just go look, AmericanNaziParty.com. Um, this is what their website looked like in 2016 when Trump was elected. Um, and they talked about anonymously and indirectly, how they worked anonymously and indirectly, how they were laying low. And that caught my attention at the time because that was exactly the phrase that was used by Jung describing Wotan prior to the, first, to the Second World War. He said Wotan was lying anonymously and indirectly within people waiting to be awakened. And so that was very striking to me. Um, also, the Nazi party has what they call the 14 words, which I'm going to have to read. I'm actually glad that I do not remember it, but we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children is the directive of the Nazi party and it's called the 14 words and when people speak in bouts of 14 words, they are, they are silently letting the other people know they are a Nazi. Like that is one of the in calls, you know, sort of the secret handshake of the Nazis and Trump did it constantly. He was constantly calling himself out as a supporter of the Nazis. Um, so this is the Nazis party's website today. So if they've changed it a little, it's a better looking website for what it's worth. But more disturbingly to me is they are no longer anonymously and indirectly, they are now actively recruiting are you tired of being blamed for all the world problems simply because you are white? So uh, they are very actively recruiting and doing it well. Lots of people really are joining the Nazi party now. Um, so that is a little problematic. And uh, <laughs> uh, Hellman would argue 
that part of the reason is because of the divi divinization of the people in question. So both Hitler and Trump um, are no longer human beings. They've now become symbol symbols to the point where he would think that he would argue that they are mashups of gods and men, which is one of the directives of the hardcore Odinists is to be a man god of the Aryan race. That is one of the things they are told to be. And so when we take a human being and we take them from being a human being and we try to divide them into their shadow and their light so that we can make them a god and a devil, um, we also cleave them, which in some ways in my very visual mind makes their souls leak out. <laughs> and so we leave that world of balance and we enter a world of dichotomy, which is not a no normal world for us to live in. And we do that individually. That guy is covered with Norse tattoos, which is very disturbing to the heathen population. Um, we also do it politically in the way that we just open ourselves up and we do it socially. So in all these different arenas, we are showing the best and the worst of us, but not the wholeness of us, not sort of the soul of us. We're just vivisected. So we've in many ways entered our own dark forest and we need to find our way out, which is where Odin rides. So one of Odin's things is that he rides through the dark forest at night, particularly in winter with the wild hunt in order to collect the souls of the dead to carry away the things that we no longer need. Occasionally he takes living people who get in the way, but mostly it's to carry away the, the dead. But you can see even in this picture that it, that's so in my mind speaks to the energy that we have been accumulating. That energy has been so growing over the past five or six years. You know, now, yeah, and no matter what they're chanting, somebody's chanting that energy probably right now. <laughs> like, that's the one that has really been carrying us forward. Um, and so we need to like look at what's going on. So I have just a moment of things happening on both sides. So part of the problem as I see it um, is that I, I don't know these people, so I'm not speaking to these particular individuals, but people like this who might carry that sign um, have an issue of worth. So very sadly in my mind, as well as frighteningly, not one way or the other for me, both sadly and frighteningly, um, a lot of people have been told by our culture and our society that their value lies in their skin color and in their gender. Um, and they have come to believe that. And so when we talk about making people equal, we are talking about robbing them of their only worth. Like they genuinely don't know that they have other worth than that. And so they feel like they no longer have a place in the world. And so it really is a desperate cry. Like it's almost like you, there's nothing, there is no counter to it because they feel they are under, under, under threat of death. And in a way they are because their ego is built on things that we are trying to take down, which is that hierarchy. Okay. And they are looking for something to live for because they no longer have that worth. They are now trying to find something that they can live for. And sadly, uh, the current struggle, the Nazi party is willing to offer it for them, is giving you, this is your meaning in life. Like you can go down fighting in order to make, pave the way for your children, right? So they are looking for that something to live for and they are willing to die for it. And I think we're not recognizing that enough. Um, I think they're not recognizing enough that the way you actually get that is through sacrifice. So this is actually a picture of Odin. The way that Odin won his worth, which in this case is the runes, is by hanging himself on a tree for nine days. He literally sacrificed himself to himself. So he took himself through his own initiation by sacrificing everything. And so they are totally not getting that the way to actually find meaning is through sacrifice. And we see that again and again and again, but that, that's being lost. On the other side, we are not getting that this is a cost. So I see this all the time. Equal rights for others does not mean fewer rights for you. It's not pie. Uh, it, it is pie because we're taking away their slaves. <laughs> um, so if I'm no longer a slave, I have robbed them of a slave.
it's not all kind and you know cheerful. We can't say, oh, you're not going to be any worse off. They they will be worse off. So there has to be something in there that is actually healing, you know, to all of us. So we need to revision. So again, if we have Odin on the stage in his horrible shadow aspect, as I believe, um, then we also need to bring his light forward. And so, you know, he's been remithed down to only his shadow, but he is not a god of shadow. He is also Santa. Odin is the original Santa Claus. So <laughs> as he's riding through the night on the wild hunt, he would actually bring goats to the homes of people who were poor so that they would live through the winter. And that's how Santa started. And to this day in Scandinavia, they drop off little goats in each other's homes and sneak them in. Um, and so he does have a component of generosity. Where is our generosity? Where is our giving? Where is our commitment to taking care of those in our community who can't care for themselves? Um, he's also wisdom. So he has actually sacrificed repeatedly in order to gain wisdom. And this is actually a picture of him with the vulva, which is a word for witch, in the Voluspa. And she's very much the feral feminine, in my opinion, of the mythology. And he goes to her for help and advice, right? She's the one who's actually leading him. And so that ability to be in a place of listening and reckoning, even to those who, you know, in our culture are not seen as hierarchies. You know what I mean? Um, he's also the god of wandering. He, so he travels the world. He loves learning about other people. He loves learning about other places. He loves seeing other perspectives. To him, that learning is a huge thing. So opening up our eyes and being able to convey wisdom in many forms and in many languages and in many dialects, I think, can't be understated. That the importance can't be understated. And finally, he's the god of magic. And so he is a god of magic and poetry and Galder. Here's the poetry one. And so he does do exactly this storytelling. He does exactly this remithing that allows us to change culture to make it one in which we can thrive. So how do we bring our stories to a place where they are actually upholding all of us, where they, you know, they show the benefit of each one of us throughout the pantheon, as it were. And then I am pretty much done. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, C. Let's show C our appreciation in the chat. Our next speaker is Brandon, whose presentation is called The Myth of Peace and Conflict Done Well. Dr. Brandon Williams Craig was co founder and CEO of the San Francisco Bay Area Nonprofit Association Building Community or ABC. He served as a postdoctoral fellow, fieldwork supervisor, and instructor for all levels of graduate students at the Pacifica Graduate Institute in the Depth Psychology Somatic Specialization. He holds an international fifth degree black belt in Aikido and has founded learning communities and served as chief instructor. He has extensive experience with private and public institutions, offers leadership, diversity, and facilitation training, and has worked in the study of peace and conflict since 1998, while providing curriculum development, conflict education, and mediation services. His teaching and research focus on the embodied somatic psychology of belief, the narrative mythological construction of culture, and the myth of peace. You can learn more about his work at culturesmith.com. Please welcome Dr. Williams Craig. Greetings, everyone. I am, um, I'm eating the second. Uh, I'm thinking a, a lot about what um, Rosalie offered and what C offered. So I'm gonna burn just a little bit of time to integrate for a second, because I feel wobbly. Um, so the feral cave dwelling, destructive, corrective, nurturing, archetypal, mother, feminine, love, burns to the ground, birth as wrestling with death. And uh, following who's your mother, who's your father, um, finding our way through fascism to generosity and wisdom and wandering and magic and poetry that Remyths for culture change. Okay, 
not trying to do justice to them, just saying what's trying to peg it so it won't totally wash me away from what I need to, uh, what I've agreed to present. Okay. Okay, I feel gratitude for life and breath and the opportunity to present to you today. Um, my name is Brandon. <clears throat> and I will begin to describe a process of moving through myth into the making of a more just society by learning archetypally how to do conflict well. And um, I would like to ask that you imagine this as a what do we do next? proposal. So after we have listened carefully to Rosalie and listened to C um, and so many of the other voices that are wonderfully clear about the ways in which we can understand story differently and share that understanding with other people in a way that can lay the foundation for culture change. Um, so many times, um, I'll, let, me talk, let me speak for myself, I found myself after a PhD in mythological studies saying, I now feel like I have my being grounded, but what do I do about that? Now, what do I do? Because people um, who are hardcore Odinists do not want to hear necessarily that there is a different understanding, a deeper, because they, they don't want to hear deeper, they want to hear, because nobody wants to have their mind changed. Um, and what I'm suggesting is, um, I hope you will find the ideas that I'm about to suggest compelling and that you'll reach out to me later to return the favor and tell me about your work. Um, that's probably a good time to say, um, please make note of any questions or comments that occur to you and bring them into the yes and session that will complete the panel um, and send anything further to me at brandon at culturesmith.com so we can continue in dialogue after this weekend concludes. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna be silent for just one second more and then I'm going to read what I have prepared so that I handle my time honorably. I'm breathing into my belly so I can start from my center as I move, uh, movement including the words and the thinking and how my body is in the space uh, as a way of grounding myself so I am not upset when I move. Um, and I'll start with an invocation. So, um, the invitation from the fates and graces who convened this remarkable and potentially essential mythologium was explicitly extended to people who think of themselves and the world mythologically and also of themselves as academics but also to professionals, uh, apparently from any field. Um, let us by all means uh, enjoy the company of kindred mythic spirits this weekend. Let us also share well-researched work that thoroughly satisfies the academic soul. Let us also warmly embrace the part of being mythologists which can't wait to speak and extend the story of our studies to professionals especially if by this we mean a majority of adult humans who work for a living, uh, citizens, as James Hillman has asked that we identify ourselves. Let us offer the gift of psychologically nuanced cultural narratives that deepen understanding by maturing worldviews. Let us translate mythic understanding into stories that lead to coordinated action because they are understandable by anybody anywhere, all bodies with life in them. In this way, we may address white supremacy and its associated privileges in myth and in the world that has not yet enjoyed the privilege of studying the liberating arts so that we may face and consign to history the terrors still being lived by the world of color and her beloved people. If there is a relationship between mythicity and healing, um, as the call of the fates and grace is suggested to us, how does that work? Um, healing physically, mentally, and emotionally falls within the rubric of the field the world is learning to call somatics, uh, which allows for living systems to be imagined whole once again. 
especially as this allows us to feel the consequences of prejudicial segregation and live into the reality of the interdependence we must now embrace in order to survive. I believe that without a communal daily practice of interdependence, we will continue to descend into ever deepening cycles of suicidal domination, murder in the name of law enforcement, mass race-based incarceration, economic and social apartheid, domestic and international homicide, and ecological collapse. As several people have already suggested this weekend, I too have terrifying dreams and am tempted to walk in the world as though I were too small and afraid to make a change to the planet on which our children will make truly terrible choices. As you might suspect, I have a proposal to offer in response to the fear I described. Let us feel the consequences of our choices now and live into a reality that challenges common practice. This will unavoidably involve conflict as differences between us work their magic. But conflict, which falls immediately into stereotypical responses and is predominantly driven by the least admirable aspects of human nature is, in fact, what is now proving fatal to the world. Conflict done well, therefore, is the essential discipline to which we must turn to survive and flourish. As adults, mythologists, psychologists, professionals, we must not only tell academic and popular stories that give roots to the growing understanding of our dilemmas, we must walk, dance, and voice specific responses to each conflict we uncover in a way that demonstrates the transformation into the just society we hope to birth. What follows is the story of a relatively small number of people who have chosen to practice together a conflict system that successfully repatterns humane responses to difference. Um, I'm gonna switch to a video. It will last five minutes and then I will be back. I think I'm gonna to switch to a video. Sharing screen, optimize for video. What kind of conflict do you practice with the people who come into your life and care? Does it work well to force them to do what you think is best? Would it work better to help them learn to trust their own discernment, uh, to find what's best for everyone? Do you want the leaders of tomorrow to be in the habit of forcing their way through difference or of practicing peace by working with those who disagree with them to find truly sustainable solutions? Peace has to do with learning to do conflict well, and this requires practice. If you agree, you're ready to work for a more civil society, a more humane world. Perhaps a world where we care for one another is just over the horizon. Welcome to Peace Practices. The choice to practice peace is now in your hands. Here's how we do it. In this story, we'll practice one way to change how bullying works. To get right to the point, we will put into words dynamics that are usually hidden. The more advanced the practitioner, the more their words will fit naturally into regular conversation. I told you not to play with her. I wasn't going to. Do what I say or you'll be sorry. How do I react automatically and find that it doesn't work out well? You're wrong. Let go. No, you're wrong. No. We use movement of the body to incorporate the concepts that we are demonstrating. For example, how do I respond with you and peace practices in mind? You're wrong. I'm listening. How can I respond by changing the rules? I told you not to play with her. You told me what to do, and you grabbed my wrist. How could everyone get what they need? Do what I say or you'll be sorry. We could play alone, or everybody could have a turn. Peace practices can help everyone learn to work and play together so that everyone gets what they need. In this story, we'll practice one way to prevent an assault. To get right to the point, we'll express hidden dynamics in words, which might happen more covertly in real life. Come on, you know you want to. I don't to. think so. If you don't, you're going to be sorry. 
How do I react automatically and find that it doesn't work out well? Come on, you know you Wait. want to. Wait! You can't! We use movement of the body to incorporate the concepts that we are demonstrating. How do I reply with you and peace practices in mind? Come on, you know you want Let's to. Let's think this through. How can I respond by changing the rules? Come on, you know you want to. No means no. I'm leaving, and if you follow, I will scream and everybody will hear me. How can everything shift? If you don't, you'll be sorry. Peace practices can help you learn to do conflict well so that you can get to a direct response immediately and whenever necessary. In this story, we'll practice staying centered and curious in order to get right to the point. This happens every time. No, it doesn't. You don't really care. It's not my fault. How do I react automatically and find that it doesn't work out well? This is your fault. No, it's your fault. We use movement of the body to incorporate the concepts that we are demonstrating. How do I reply with you and peace practices in mind? This is your fault. Tell me more. How can everything shift? This is your fault. Can we make some time to talk about this? Peace practices can help anyone learn to do conflict well so that you can stay focused on the most necessary issues and move toward a shift that will help everyone. The method you've just seen is called martial nonviolence because it's been proven to break the cycle of violence and can be learned like a martial art. When you take martial nonviolence and you create a program for a specific group of people, that's called peace practices because peace requires practice to be your best option in the middle of stress. If you choose to bring peace practices into your community, you'll learn to do conflict well, to work well together, and you'll carry tools through the rest of your life to practice peace out in the world. Please make contact so we can design a program specifically for you, work with you in class and one-on-one. -on -one. The work of peace will then be in your hands. Please subscribe to our video series as well so you can integrate this work with yours. And thank you very much for being here. So long ago, in a different world that is not so far removed from our own, um, a child learned from experience that it was possible to choose who to be by playing different roles. This child is me, of course, for the purposes of this story. So from three years old, a liberal education demonstrated that these roles are older than anyone I could imagine and also alive around me in the time that is always today at church, on stage, at the Dallas Theater Center from the age of six, I learned that a community can tell any story it likes somatically, individual bodies working together at any scope and can choose to work across lines of age, race, gender, sexual orientation, political affiliation, demonstrating ways to work through archetypal conflicts in a way that deepens the understanding of all who participate. So as a teenager, I began to explore conflict concretely through the martial arts, um, and finding Aikido as an undergraduate in order to embody nonviolence, even under pressure that might otherwise force me into habits that would diminish me and harm my soul. Uh, toward this end, and to apply what I was learning to groups of increasing size, I learned process arts, community building, organizational leadership, mediation, and formalized my study of liberal psychology as cultural mythology by attending Pacifica Graduate Institute. My dissertation was entitled The Myth of Peace, A Culture of Peacemaking, the Process Arts and the Emergence of a Global Communitarian Mythology. Uh, the dissertation put in the formal academic framework of archetypal psychology, the research I had been doing as I created a process to share what had led me to work for a world that works for everyone in it. An archetypal lens, developed by what I learned to call a somatic education had led me to apply a mythic frame in order to make my efforts communicable and sustainable. I added language to traditional Aikido techniques in order to help my students understand the movement being communicated into the body of an attacker, transforming them 
from adversary into a partner. I call this Aikido 2.0 because most Aikido instructors do not include communication in the training they offer. Adding theater improvisation, I began to prepare my students to apply their counterintuitive somatic literacy to everyday interactions and to facilitate groups, calling this martial nonviolence. So using martial nonviolence to design curricula for specific organizations and schools, we called our work peace practices, secured international funding, and created relationships with nonprofits. We worked in downtown Oakland with men of color experiencing cognitive disabilities, with women in hidden street shelters with their children recovering from intimate violence. We participated in social justice demonstrations, offering conflict interventions and witnessing. We re recreated a dojo at the University of California at Berkeley uh, and were invited to offer training at Oscar Grant Plaza during Occupy Oakland. Uh, one of my students um, was chosen to be head of security for that. Um, I was invited by an international peace organization and went to introduce peace practices at their training across borders conference in Greece. Um, uh, the children of peace practices were inspired by this adventure to reach out and express appreciation for the leaders from conflict zones who gathered, some at great personal risk, to train together in Aikido to work toward peace in the most difficult circumstances. Leaders from troubled areas, including Jordan, Iraq, Palestine, Israel, Bosnia, Serbia, Turkey, Greece, Cyprus, Ethiopia, Brazil, and the United States, responded to the children with messages of gratitude and studied the peace practices curriculum with the hope of carrying it home with them. Framing the entire system as conflict done well, we expanded to churches, municipal government, consulting with businesses, and began to train assistant instructors to be conflict professionals. In 2017, I accepted an invitation and came back home to introduce our work embodying nonviolence as a research coordinator and instructor in the somatic psychology department at Pacifica Graduate Institute. Now I need to end sharing. Okay, right. Uh, okay, the next steps are twofold. First, I have returned to live in North Texas and I'm very interested in contributing to the social and political change happening here. Um, I have begun looking for opportunities to work in national and international contexts and just contributed to our area's successful enumeration for the 2020 census while working with the Department of Commerce. Um, second, uh, second step, um, I concluded the dissertation with the neologism I now believe is the natural extension of conflict done well idea. I created the term blue volution to suggest that an archetypal move is coming. Uh, I'm going to invoke Rosalie again. Uh, a feral cave dwelling, destructive, corrective, feminine, nurturing, burning everything down. I would like to add um, away from domination and the unbounded consumption of each other. Uh, I believe we will learn about suffering together by washing away the literal and metaphorical dead. Uh, the, the ride through the dark forest with the hunt um, after which we'll discover what remains. Uh, it may be that we will learn to choose more collectively how we are born, live and work through conflict and die. Um, this was the focus of my sort of imagistic article of the same title, Blue Pollution, in the second volume of the Journal of Archetypal Studies, which was entitled Toward Beginnings, Images of End. Uh, the most rewarding questions today seem to revolve around the way in which we choose to learn what I'm calling blue pollution, um, as there are both shallow and authentic ways to suffer. And I would like to suggest that we learn the more authentic ways that were outlined for us in the two previous presentations. Um, the global virus in progress today makes it possible to sense with greater clarity the parallel psychological but no less lethal pandemics hidden within our social systems, supremacies and violent domination operated with the mythic levers of race and gender and nationality. We are forced to see the earth suffer as a whole for the first time so that the parallel need to heal our stories, our worldview or die literally in the hundreds of thousands might be strong enough to change our behavior. We are forced to gather virtually 
So even the reach of this small group of the mythically inclined is now global. The struggle with white supremacy and the ongoing action of colonial mythologies takes place on at least two fronts, both at home and in places we find very difficult to feel at home, um, both, both of which need new habits to address successfully. So for instance, rubber meeting the road. I know that there are many instances of diversity within Pacifica, uh, Pacifica alumni, Irie Wild, and the collection of Mythologium presenters. And it will not be news to any of these groups that we must accept that we are predominantly white in order to address the legacy of white supremacy active in our midst. I say we because I'm a privileged, middle-aged white man, and because I love and identify with much of who we are in the work we do. I also believe that it is a moral obligation to work directly with the somatic, which is to say physical and psychological, literal and figurative, cultural and mythic afflictions from which we are dying. So white supremacy and colonialism are an essential place to work together, not only because the daily body count continues to grow, but also because our privilege affords us the opportunity to practice specific responses, which deploy mythic understanding of archetypal roles in order to begin healing any of the lethal syndromes which afflict us. So it goes beyond the scope of what can be done in the time allotted for a panel presentation, but let us borrow Pacifica as a sympathetic and resilient partner in order to imagine the following process applied to any institution. Begin with a story everyone knows as it is represented in public. We might visit, for instance, the College Factual Diversity Report for Pacifica. Next, it might make sense to build relationships with members of the Diversity and Inclusion Council by conducting interviews and asking for recent results of their work, both database and narrative. Um, a martial sense of nonviolence would then lead us to explore areas in which differences of opinion and divergent analysis point to potential conflicts as areas of learning. With myth and conflict trained colleagues, improvisational proposals would then be crafted to mythologize and perform the differences that we are hearing, expecting to meet resistance and other familiar reactions, but practicing counterintuitive responses which move toward a sustainable process, redirecting rather than participating in aggression or subservience. These would be embodied, embodied to simulate the stresses involved and somatic strategies would be chosen and practiced together to prepare to be an agent of positive change based on the needs and dynamics of the actual bodies involved. Then the proposals would be brought back to persons involved in the community and the process would continue back and forth in energetic and resting phases until a positive change could be demonstrated in a way that is understandable to anyone with an interest. It's an example of how martial nonviolence would be applied. What you're, what you're not seeing is the physicalization of this work, um, but please um, extrapolate from what you saw in the video and I'll be happy to, to show you um, at another time. So I, I need to end. Um, I mentioned at the outset that you might make a note of any questions or comments that occurred to you and send any or all of them to me at brandon at culturesmith.com. So we may continue in dialogue after this weekend concludes. Um, my website, culturesmith.com is also available to you at any time. There is a new connection ask on the homepage, which directs you as to where you may put your thoughts. And I will publish resources from this presentation via my email list for which I cordially invite you to sign up. Um, I also invite uh, anyone who would like to join us to visit conflictdonewell.com and dial into any of my weekly classes. Um, in each class, after preparing our bodies for conflict, as a group, we support each other to work through and prepare specific responses to domination and other forms of violence in daily life. Um, I was happy to bring these ideas as an instructor at Pacifica and would be just as happy to work with anyone who would like to explore the practice of developing in a mythological direction by professionalizing their conflict skills. Um, thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Let's hear it for Brandon's presentation via the chat. This panel, <laughs> wow, uh, yes, this panel, um, it needed the space, it needed the depth, and, and we are at time <laughs> right now. So what I would like to do is invite each of you to, if you could, in brevity, say one word, one word that comes to your mind, to your heart, to your soul, from everything that was brought into the space 
uh, just right now. And while you're thinking on that one word, I want to invite all of the attendees to please, uh, you saw the websites, everyone put their contact information in the chat. I think this panel needs a lot more space and a lot more conversation and a lot more time and um, definitely reach out to these speakers um, and keep that conversation going. So I'm gonna go around um, in the same order in which you presented. If you have one word or a phrase that comes from what you heard today and share that with me. So Rosalie. Sorry, I didn't unmute. Um, I, I think what comes to me is just integration, just integrating it all, each other's ideas, old ideas, new ideas, just integrating. Thank you. See? Bow, just bow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Brandon? So hard to choose. <laughs> Birth is wrestling with death. Mm. Thank you. And I just, again, thank you, all of you, all of you for this. Um, and a big thank you to PGI, well, PGIAA for sponsoring this panel. Um, and again, uh, Olivia, do you want to add a word as well? Yeah, I was just. <laughs> yeah, if I can just take a, another minute. Uh, yeah, I just, um, I just want to close it out by um, praising these wonderful presenters and their, their marvelous presentations. Um, I think we can see how um, these themes of myth intertwine with healing through reframing our ideas around culture and religion and conflict. Um, Rosalie, I really liked how you brought us into your presentation through the Western and European understanding of Plato and Descartes and how we can apply that to stories that, uh, or how we do apply that to stories that have no business being analyzed in such a way. Um, and I really appreciate some of your key phrases there of what is, is lovingly destroyed and the need for connection with destruction. Uh, these are wonderful insights into this culture and tradition and how we might consider them. Uh, C, I really appreciated your opening meditation to call us in to consider our biases and ideas about love and care. Um, thank you for your in-depth historical um, and mythological explanation of these strands here. Um, I think there's a lot of big ideas to be mined from this um, tradition and what sort of implications we have for our future and the myths that we are watching and reading. Um, and Brandon, um, I also I really appreciate the pause that you started with. I think we needed that to kind of take a second to reset, to get into um, kind of bringing it all home there. Um, conflict is definitely a part of life, and I really appreciate your insight into navigating a natural emotional experience for us. Um, and I'm sure PGIA would be happy to work with you further throughout other projects here. Um, and I just want to finish by thanking Joanna and Stephanie and the Mythologium for hosting this conversation and highlighting the importance of um, race and healing um, in mythology. Um, and I just want to thank uh, Diane Travis T. She's our Director of Alumni Relations for coordinating the planning of this proposal here and our sponsorship. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about uh, PGIAA, uh, we have many resources available, especially for alumni, but also for community members, which you all here are part of our community. Um, so please visit our website at PGIAA. Dot org for more information on what we're doing, events, and community resources. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. And again, please connect with these speakers. Uh, keep this conversation going. Very grateful to you all. Um,